Welcome back to Making Sense of Revelation. Now for the penultimate part, part seven. We've only got one more after this one. So as I always say, there's a handout available in the description just to help you follow along. Now we're gonna today be getting into chapters 20 and 21. We're at the end of Revelation now. And you and I are actually mentioned in this chapter that we're gonna look at today. Obviously what we've been seeing so far is it's about the past. But you and I, if we are indeed believers in Christ, are mentioned here. So watch out for yourself. So, so far we've seen that everything in the book is seen as coming soon to John's audience and to John. And I have to apologise that we've not been able to go through the whole book. You know, I'd love to do that. Um, I'd love to look at all these different ways and how we can understand them in their context. But from what we have seen, we can see that the book constantly uses short time phrases Things happen in 42 months or three and a half years or 1260 days, you know, which by the way, the eagle eyed amongst you will notice are all, all the same time period. You know, it's the same three and a half year period. It's the same when you find the phrase a time times and half a time, you know, Anna always jokes about what the heck does this mean? Well, it's, it's the same thing, three and a half years, you know, a time is a year. So a time times and half a time is a year, two years and half a year, three and a half years. But it also uses time frames like an hour, or 10 days, or five months. It, it uses plenty of um, short time periods. Now, as I say, our, our normal method of interpretation should be that these are symbolic timestamps that communicate shortness. Now, as we saw, there are some times where God has, has made these prophecies actualize in, in the actual time frames that are there, you know, so we saw like the beast's persecution of the church would take 42 months, which really did happen historically, and that the holy city trampling would be 42 months. But this isn't the norm. Anyway, the, the, the point is that the, the book's expectation is, as opens in chapter 1, verse 1, that things must shortly take place. And as we saw, they did. But then as you go through this book, we get to somewhere very distinct from the rest of the book where the subject matter seems to completely change, and that's chapter 20. Now, before we get into it, if you haven't already uh, read it, then take some time, pause the video, and just read from chapter 20, verse 1, into chapter 21, verse 8, just so you have it all fresh in your mind. So remember that this passage comes straight after the judgment of the great harlot. She has now been destroyed, and her judgment has been proclaimed by Christ, uh, on her and on every other one who would rise like her. So Old Covenant Jerusalem has now been dealt with. So Biblical Judaism now ceases to exist. There is no longer such a thing as Judaism that is biblically warranted. So how does chapter 20 follow? What's it all about? Well, when we read chapter 20, what do you notice that's completely unlike the rest of the book so far? The time frame is nothing like any of the others. The time frame is so comparatively massive. You know, a thousand years. We go from 42 months and three and a half years to now a thousand years. And it's also known as the millennium. You know, it's so big that what John is doing is he's taking us outside the realm of the book's immediate subject, you know, the fall of Jerusalem. He's taking us outside of that. It's, it's too big to fit in that period. No, it's very reasonable for John to be writing in 65 AD about events that will be complete within five years and use the phrase soon, shortly or near. That's very reasonable. However, it's completely unreasonable to be describing events within five years with the phrase a thousand years, you know, even with symbolic numbers. For John to describe events that would be complete within five years as a, you know, a thousand years is, is a bit ridiculous. So what is this millennium all about? And it's funny, if you ask a Christian what their view on the end times is, or you know, eschatology as it gets called, they will probably tell you a position that is named after this passage. So the three positions are amillennial, premillennial, or postmillennial. You know, the millennial comes from the millennium. This is absolutely baffling to me that we name our whole position from one passage at the very back of the Bible. You know, this thousand years never appears anywhere else. There's no other mention of this millennium, but it gets treated like the text for the end times. But the first rule we all have to use when we study scripture is that we let the clear and the obvious texts 
interpret the unclear or vague texts. The clear interprets the unclear, not vice versa. So we shouldn't interpret the rest of the Bible through the millennium. We should interpret the millennium by what the rest of the Bible says. It's quite a confusing passage. So let's unpack the millennium and then we'll see why it's here and why, what it's doing at the back of Revelation. So what's the millennium marked by? Well, it's a thousand years of Christ reigning, of Satan being bound. There's a first resurrection, you know, whatever that means. And there's a second resurrection after the millennium. And that first point, Christ reigning, that really does settle for us what the millennium is. Bear in mind, the millennium is a thousand years of Christ reigning. Well, when did Jesus begin his reign? Is it something that we're waiting for? No. And you will find it a burdensome task to try and find a place in the New Testament where after the ascension, they don't think Jesus is currently reigning. You know, it's very much the assumption that Jesus is now on the throne. I'm just going to read a section from Peter's sermon in Acts 2, you know, immediately after the ascension. So in verses 22 to 24, Uh, Peter says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he he talks about Jesus having been resurrected according to the scriptures. And then a bit further down, he says this, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know therefore for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So killed by lawless men, raised by God, now king you know christ or messiah the same word literally translated means anointed one but it's a hebrew expression for king and so peter quotes psalm 110 which is a coronation psalm about the messiah and then says that you, he has made him both lord and king so jesus is now reigning starting from his ascension so what is the millennium It is this period that we currently live in of Christ's reign. You know, a thousand is a number used throughout scripture to communicate massiveness. So just think about it in in Psalm 84 where it says, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. It's not saying, well, if I had to choose between one day in God's courts and a thousand and one days elsewhere, I don't know which one I'd go for. Or, Or when God says in Exodus that he shows mercy to a thousand generations, it doesn't mean, but no mercy for the thousand and first. It's, it's communicating everlasting mercy. And then just, just one more, Psalm 50, where it says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Well, are there cattle that don't belong to God on the thousand and first hill? No, of course not. It's a, it's a symbolic number that's used to describe lots and lots and lots. So we can read the millennium as a very, very long time. And so it started when Jesus first came, or at his ascension, and it'll finish when he comes back. And so really, the people who take this thousand year period as a literal thousand spins around the sun are in danger of making the millennium far too short. You know, we've done 2,000 years and we're still only partway through the millennium. Now, his ascent, from ascension to his second coming, that's, that is the millennium. We are living under Christ's reign. But just before we get into the significance of what this really means, you might be wondering about this business of Satan being bound and this first and second resurrection. You know, what do these mean? So let's look at the resurrection first. Now, bear in mind that the Christian hope is not that we die and go to heaven forever. The hope is that at the end of time, our bodies are resurrected like Christ's was to live on the new earth. So how are we to understand these two resurrections you know, especially the one that happens during the millennium, you know, where we are now. Well, let's look at how Jesus talks about the resurrection in John 5. Now, bear in mind, John is the same author as Revelation, so there's a lot of similar themes. So Jesus in John 5 verse 24 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He, who, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Did you hear what he did there? He talks about two resurrection, two resurrections. First, we are resurrected spiritually when we believe in God. Now, bear in mind, spiritually doesn't mean non-literally. It just means non-physical. It's still a literal resurrection. It's just from our deadness in sin. And then secondly, we are resurrected bodily at the end of time. So in verse 25, Jesus says a time is coming and now is. So is already here. And it talks about how people are being resurrected by believing in him, spiritual resurrection. And then in verse 28 and 29, Jesus then moves on saying an hour is coming, purely future. It doesn't say it now is where he talks about the physical resurrection at the end of all time. You know, this is a big theme from John 5 to John 6. Jesus really emphasises the fact that those who are his will be resurrected to eternal life at the last day. So the first resurrection is coming to faith in Christ. Like verse 24 says, whoever believes has passed from death to life. Which is why back in Revelation chapter 20, it says that the rest of the dead, i.e. non-believers, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. You know, they remain dead in their sins. But this verse, this is where you and I are mentioned. It says this, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. We are blessed and holy, and we reign with him. That's us right there in the text. We're the ones who are sharing in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. And then after the millennium, everyone, sinner and saint, is raised bodily for judgment day, as we see a bit further down in Revelation 20. So that's the two resurrections, the spiritual resurrection, which we have when we believe in Christ, and the physical resurrection, where we are raised at the end of time. So what about this first and second death we see in Revelation 20? Well, Revelation 20 actually defines what the second death is in verse 14. It says it's, it's hell being thrown into the lake of fire. Which is why the second death has no power over us who share in the first resurrection. The first death is bodily death. You know, we all go through that. But the second death, that means that's nothing to us. We're, we're free from hell. So the two resurrections are first spiritual, second bodily. And the two deaths are first bodily and then spiritual, you know, or eternal death in hell. So that's the resurrections that we see in Revelation 20. And as we see, that perfectly fits in with this, um, the millennium being the whole time of Christ's reign. So what about Satan being bound? Well, this isn't actually unique to Revelation. Jesus talks about this in his ministry. So he talks about seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven, you know, when he's cast out. But one of Jesus's parables really explains what it means for Satan to be bound and it's called the parable of the strong man that's bound. So in Matthew 12, Mark 3, Luke 11, Jesus is talking about Satan when he says to his disciples, you can't plunder a strong man's house unless you first tie him up. Or unless, you know, unless the strong man is bound, you can't plunder his possessions. So the binding of Satan is about limiting Satan's power. So the gospel can go forth and Christ's kingdom can extend. In other words, because Jesus has bound Satan, we can now go on with plundering his house. Now, bear in mind, Jesus taught this as a present reality. So we should have no difficulty with Revelation 20 also being a present reality. Satan is currently bound. He was bound by Christ at his first coming. So that's the resurrections and Satan bound. So we've seen how these things fit into the millennium. But let's get back to the significance of the millennium. So the millennium is this period we live in now, but you know, so what? How should we understand it? Well, as I said, it's not right that we build a whole view of the end times on one paragraph at the back of the Bible. You know, if we want to understand Jesus' reign, 
let's look at the places where the Bible explains that explains what the kingdom of God is like. You know, the kingdom of God is synonymous with the millennium. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this at all, but all I'm going to say is that when you look at Jesus' parables of the kingdom, a common theme is that the kingdom starts off tiny, you know, so like a mustard seed or like a leaven or so on, but it gradually grows and grows until it fills the whole creation. So like a mustard tree grows into a huge tree or a leaven works its way through a whole loaf. And this motif of the kingdom starting off small and growing massive isn't unique to Jesus. It's how Daniel prophesies the kingdom will come. So in Daniel 2, he says that the kingdom is like a stone that destroys every other kingdom and it gradually turns into a mountain. And then that mountain gradually fills the whole earth. So this millennium that we are living in is an expanding rule of Christ. You know, we have this hope that one day all creation will be under his authority. Now, notice the millennium ends before Jesus comes back. So I'm, I'm not saying, oh, one day after Jesus has come back, all creation will be under his authority. Now, that's obvious. Of course it will. I'm saying before Jesus comes back, his kingdom will have filled the whole earth. There is optimism for the future, not pessimism. This is a progressively expanding kingdom. The whole point of this passage is to emphasise the victory of Christ. You know, in Revelation 20, even when Satan is released at the end of the millennium, notice he doesn't actually get to do any damage. He gets released, he assembles an army, but before he can do anything, it says that fire came down out of heaven and consumed him. It's all about Christ's victory over his enemies. So what's it doing here in Revelation? Why is it important? Well, let's remember that Revelation is about the removal of Old Covenant Israel in order to fully establish the New Covenant. He judges his adulterous bride in order to introduce his faithful bride. In other words, if Revelation ended at chapter 19 with Israel judged, the story would be incomplete. It wouldn't be finished. God has plans, however, beyond just dealing with Israel. He has a plan to invade the whole of creation. So Revelation is about Christ beginning that initial stage of sweeping away his enemies by removing the ones who pierced him. Remember chapter 1 verse 7, he's coming against those who pierced him in order to begin the process of defeating all of his enemies. That's what Psalm 110, that psalm that Peter quoted, is all about. That's what the Messiah's mission is, to defeat his enemies gradually. Just look at how Paul quotes Psalm 110 in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus comes back after he has defeated every enemy and that last enemy is death. So in Revelation, he is, we see he has now established his kingdom never to be defeated. Unlike the system that he is now judged and swept away with, his kingdom cannot be swept away. So there we have the, the millennium, the period that we are in. Now, bear in mind, you might say to me, well, you talk about this optimism, you talk about the kingdom expanding, but it doesn't seem like everything's getting better, you know, <laughs> especially with this virus going on. We could talk for hours about this and, and I could say how I could show you how things are getting better. I mean, for instance, I'm talking to you through a, a, a box at the moment over the Internet. But the point is, for all we know, we could still be in the very first section of the millennium. You know, If you see the millennium like this, we could be here. Who's to say that we're at the end? You know, there could be another 40,000 years till Jesus comes back. You know, in which case, we'll be seen as the early church. I'm not saying that that is how long I think it will be. It might be. But the, the point is, the thousand years is a massive period of time in, in which time Jesus will bring his kingdom everywhere. So uh, yeah, there is hope that this millennium is the expanding reign of Christ. That's what the millennium in chapter 20 is. Now, lastly, we're just going to look at the new heavens and the new earth in chapter 21. Now, we have a tendency to see this prophecy about the new creation as something only for the end of time. But that's not quite right. Otherwise, you know, God doesn't start making all things new until the end of time. 
which is not at all in agreement with what the New Testament teaches about the new creation. It teaches that the new creation has begun. But it also means that the church isn't revealed until the end. You know, notice the heavenly Jerusalem comes out of heaven, but that's clearly not true because here we are, the church. So you might say, well, are we in the new heavens and the new earth then? And then to which I'd say yes and no. Yes, because the new creation has been established and is being rolled out as Christ's kingdom extends. Bear in mind, it's it's gradual. But no, because the fullness of the new creation is something is yet to be completed. You know, no death, no no mourning, no crying, no pain. That's clearly far off. But this prophecy is a prophecy that is that is being rolled out. You know, the concept of the new heavens and the new earth, this prophecy comes from Isaiah 65. Now, if we were to read Isaiah 65 as though it were purely future, we would have some problems. Because Isaiah describes the new heavens and the new earth like this. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Do you see the problem there with making it purely future? We'd not only be saying that people who have been resurrected after Judgment Day can still die, but we're also saying that there'd be sinners there too. And yet in Revelation 21, we see in the new heavens and the new earth, there is no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, and no sinners. So what we're seeing here in these two prophecies is that the new creation is, is something that begins with Jesus' first coming and that his second coming will be complete. The cherry is put on the top when death is defeated. You know, like we saw earlier in, in Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Death is the last enemy and then the new creation is done. So we are currently in the new heavens and the new earth. You know, the new heavens and the new earth have started to invade the old order. And yet we await the new heavens and the new earth in its fullness when Jesus returns. But the whole point of Revelation 20 to 21 is to provoke our hope for this. Is to say, this has begun, now let's be so excited for it to come in its fullness. So as we read through Revelation, we are being showed how our Lord Jesus has removed what clung on from the old covenant, where God's presence was bound to one location, in order to establish his church and send his gospel to transform and fill every corner of creation. As I say, whilst most of this book is about events in our past, so most of this book up to chapter 19 is about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. It would be an unfinished book though if it didn't talk about events in our present and in our future, and chapter 20 is that turning point. Christ has judged Old Covenant Israel in order to establish his rule, his reign. And you know, if you read Daniel 7, it's the same order. So there we are, seven parts of the way through making sense of Revelation now. And now in the next part, we're going to be applying this book, seeing what it means for us. So I hope you've enjoyed that today. And as I say, the millennium can cause so many arguments. So if you do want to talk to me, talk to me about it, I'm more than happy to give you the different views and the pros and the cons and why I land where I do. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll see you for part eight. Thanks a lot. Bye.